We have a very special guest today. We have Mr. Uh, Paul Nation, Professor Paul Nation from uh, New Zealand. So he's going to be covering uh, vocabulary, teaching vocabulary with you guys today. Uh, Paul, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Just need your camera. I'll be handing it off to Paul. Um, just pay attention to the chat. I will be sending out the handout link very shortly. So I'm going to go ahead and um, hand it off to Mr. Paul Nation here, who will be helping you guys with uh, how to teach vocabulary. So I will see you guys uh, in an hour. So enjoy the presentation, and thank you, Paul, for taking the time out to do this uh, webinar for us. Good. No problem. Now, just let's just check that uh, everybody can see. Uh, can you see the PowerPoint? Yeah, good. Okay. Right. So today I want to talk about. Um, oh, Paul, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, we need to share one more time. Oh, okay. Um, 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 that's the one. Okay. Good, and we want to do full screen, is that right? Yes, from beginning. Okay. okay. Thank you. Good. Okay. So, today I'm talking about teaching vocabulary to young children. And in many ways, the topic of this talk is, is actually a strange topic because it's got teaching in the title of the topic. And really, I hope the message that you'll get from today is that in order for young children, and indeed for anybody to properly learn vocabulary, teaching is only a small part of the learning. And so a better title for this would be helping young children learn vocabulary. So we'll come, we'll come to that soon, but what I want to begin with is, first of all, to find out what vocabulary children need to learn. So let's, uh, oops, here we are. Yeah. And so I think for young children, uh, the first thing, to, and, and for anybody, is to focus on the high frequency words of English. The first 2,000 to 3,000 words. There's been some interesting research in Europe which finds that children who have never studied English before actually know quite a lot of English when they come to the first English class. And the reason is because, largely because of the internet, they meet up with a lot of English vocabulary through doing things on the internet. And it seems that European children uh, who speak languages which are closely related to English actually know a lot of English vocabulary before they begin to learn English. I have a suspicion that that's the same probably throughout the whole world. And that's because of the effect of uh, the internet on learning. We know that in Japanese, for example, about half of the high frequency words are already used in Japanese by Japanese speakers as loan words. Uh, and even though sometimes the meaning that they give to those words is not exactly the same as the meaning that the words have in English, at least part of the form of the word is already known and some kind of part of the meaning is known. So it's, it's interesting then to try and find out how many words young children know. And one of the tools that we developed to do that is called the Picture Vocabulary Size Test. And you can find access to this tool in the website which is listed uh, in what you can see on your screen. If, if you haven't got time to write it down, don't worry, because it's on the handout. And if you also type Paul nation resources into Google. It'll take you to that website. So a few years ago, 
uh, a colleague and I developed the picture vocabulary size test. In this test, tests the first, oh, I've got a mistake here. It says 60,000, but it should be 6,000. Uh, it tests the first 6,000 words of English. And it does it simply using pictures and sentences that children listen to. We have used this test with the young native speakers, native speakers who are six years old and eight years old. We've tried it with five years old and it, it works okay for some of them, but for others it doesn't work because they, they're more interested in playing around rather than sitting the test. But this test is freely available and you can, you can download it and use it to test your own children or the learners in your class. In order to take the test, the learners don't have to be able to read, but if they can read, then a written version of each sentence is, all, is available in the test. If learners are quite good at reading English, then you don't have to use the picture vocabulary size test and you can use one of the levels tests. And the levels tests are made up of five different levels, which test the first thousand, second thousand, right up to the fifth thousand words of English. You can find um, hard copies, if you like, of these tests on my web, uh, web resources page. So there are a couple of tests then that you could use to find out how many words your children know. I think it's useful to do this, at least for some learners in the class, so you get a feeling for what their vocabulary knowledge actually is. I think that most parents and teachers might be surprised to find that their learners actually know quite a lot of English vocabulary already. So if they don't know the first two or 3,000 words of English, it's really important that these words are dealt with first because these words occur very, very often in English. In, in any language, we have a small number of words which occur very often and which are really important for using the language. And we have a large number of words which are not used very often. These large, this large number of words, um, this vocabulary is important, but it is not as important as the high frequency words. So it's really important that learners learn the most useful vocabulary first, because then they'll be able to use what they know more easily. Now let's move on from what vocabulary to look at how vocabulary is learned. In a well-balanced language course, vocabulary is learned across four equal integrated strands. Now, integrated here means each of the four strands covers roughly the same material. It should include the same vocabulary and ideally would include the same content material. Now, each of these strands is equal. So that means if you look at a language course, then equal amount of time should be spent on each one of the four strands. So a quarter of the time should be spent on listening and speaking, listening and reading, sorry. And listening and reading means real listening and real reading. And that, that means using material which is the right level for the learners, but reading in order to enjoy a book, reading to get information, listening in order to understand, listening in order to really get the message of what's being listened to. These, these kinds of listening and reading are often called extensive listening and extensive reading and they are really important for vocabulary development. It's possible for learners to read enough and to listen to enough to learn around about a thousand words a year if they are doing this with material which is at the right level for them. 
So that means about a quarter of the time in a good English course should be spent reading graded readers, which are very easy and at the right level for the learners, and listening to material, which is really easy and interesting and is at the right level for the learners. I'm waiting for the day, which I think will come very soon, when listening material can be edited to get out the words which are not high-frequency words and replace them with low-frequency words so that the learners can listen to material uh, which is at the right level for them in the same way as which they can read material where the low frequency words have been taken out and replaced with high frequency words. Okay, I see a few questions. Um, does, does anybody want to ask a couple of questions now before I continue? Gary, can we handle that? Yep, that's fine. So if you guys want to uh, put some questions in the chat, uh, I did see one earlier. Um, we had a question from Julian. How about infrequent words such as lion and tiger, etc.? Uh, no matter what use you make of English, there will always be topic words which you have to make, which you have to use. If you're reading a story about a lion, it's pretty hard not to use the word lion. The main thing is make sure that the, these topic words, which are, which are not high, but make sure that they are repeated within the material so that they have a chance of being learnt. The big problem with low frequency words is that they are often not repeated in the material. They occur only once and then they're not seen or heard again. So I think it's okay to include topic words which relate to the particular topic being focused on, but make sure that each of those topic words are repeated. And if they're not repeated, then see if you can just get rid of them. Any other question? Yeah, so we have some in the Q&A. Uh, we have one. So what can you do if you are working with students who do not have a good grasp of the basics? Yeah, your curriculum expects them to. Well, I think, you should, I think you should do what I'm telling you to do now, and that is make sure that they have a good balance of opportunities for learning. If they don't have a, a very large vocabulary but a very small vocabulary, then you need to use material which is at the right level for them. Now, for English, this is actually not difficult because there are graded readers which start at the 100 word level. The foundation series of graded readers consists of books which are written using only 100 different words. So it's not hard to get material which is at the right level for learners. So that's what you need to do. You need to make sure that they are covering the four strands with material which is at the right level for them. Okay, one more question and then I move on. Okay, so we got one more from Laura. What do you think about giving vocabulary about a topic before a reading? Is it meaningful? <sighs> the research on this is not very encouraging. The pre-teaching of vocabulary has to be done rather thoroughly in order for words to make the, subs the following reading easier. Uh, and that means spending two or three minutes probably on each word. I would not spend much time doing pre-teaching of vocabulary except perhaps for some topic vocabulary that I think they might have great trouble dealing with. I would probably let them get on with doing the activity and try to provide some supports such as a glossary or something like that during the activity. Pre-teaching takes quite a lot of time and the, the research on the effects of deliberately teaching vocabulary also isn't very encouraging. If you look at experiments on this, after vocabulary has been taught by the teacher, 
you're lucky if half of the learners can get it right on a test which follows the teaching. And that's on a receptive knowledge test. If you use a productive knowledge test, you're lucky if a third of them get it correct. I think it's not a bad idea to do a little bit of background knowledge teaching, bringing in the vocab like that, but it will just be the first meeting with the vocabulary. But in general, I wouldn't spend a lot of time pre-teaching. I would rather the learners get on and experience the input itself. Okay, so the first strand then of a course where we would expect a lot of vocabulary learning to take place is the strand of input, and that is learning through listening and reading. And I call them strands because they are, a strand is, you know, uh, your, your hair consists of strands of hair. I used to pull out a piece of my hair each time I taught a class to demonstrate what a strand was, how it's something which is long and continuous. In my present state, I can't afford to do that, so you'll just have to put up with my demonstration of showing you the strand rather than pulling out my hair. The second strand in a well-balanced course is a strand of output, and that is learning through speaking and writing. And teachers can design material which support the learners in their speaking and writing, which gives them a chance to, to use productively the words that they have met in listening and reading. And having to produce these words in speaking and writing gives a much stronger knowledge of the words. So about a quarter of the time in a well-balanced language course should be spent on doing speaking and writing activities where learners make use of the vocabulary knowledge and the grammar knowledge that they've met in listening and reading. This speaking can involve things like prepared talks and mini conversations, doing some problem solving speaking, uh, using memorized dialogues. When you begin to learn another language, memorizing sentences is a very excellent way to begin because you can start using the vocabulary immediately. I am actually very fluent in about five or six languages, but I'm only fluent in a few sentences in those languages. And when I speak to someone who speaks those, uh, one of those languages, they think, wow, this guy's very fluent. In fact, I only know about 10 or 12 sentences in those languages, but I have learned them very fluently because I want them to be able to produce them in output. Now, your learners should be learning to produce the high frequency vocabulary that they know through speaking and writing activities. And memorizing sentences and phrases is a very good way to start off this process. Okay, any more questions before I move on? Yeah, it looks like we have a lot of questions. So maybe if we have time at the end, we can uh, have a, a Q and A oh. session. Yeah, that's no, try a couple now. It's quite okay. good if people, otherwise I don't want people to get left behind. Okay. Yeah, so let's go with, so we have one here from Benjamin. Uh, you said about children being able to learn thousands of words a year. How many words a no. year do you think adults can learn? Because children arguably absorb quicker and better than adults. Native speakers of English up to the age of about... Mm, it's up to their teenage years, say, let's say 16 or 18, learn about a thousand words a year. And this then drops after they reach about, say, I think maybe 15, 16,000 words. This rate drops, not because of lack of ability, but because of a lack of opportunity, because there are so few words which are repeated enough times to be learned. I, I'm not saying that young children learn thousands of words a year. Young native speakers learn round about 1,000 words a year. Some learn at a slightly higher rate than others, but even the ones learning at the lowest rate are still learning several hundred words a year. 
children who learn English as a foreign language don't seem to match that. And I think it's not because of a lack of ability, but simply a lack of opportunity in that the courses do not provide enough opportunity for input and output, which is realistic. I think if language courses provided lots of input, reading input, so that children were reading and listening to thousands and thousands of words a year, then they would learn a lot of vocabulary each year, up, up to a thousand words. I also think that adults can learn a thousand words a year. Uh, but you have to do lots of reading to do that. If you want to read about this, you can go to my web resources page and look in my publications. And around about 2015, I think it was, there's an article about how much input, reading input, you need to learn the first thousand, second thousand, third thousand words, and so on like that. And you can get information about the quantity of input needed for learning. Any other question? Yeah, let's grab one from chat. Uh, so we have one from Mina Kwan. Is deliberate learning involve, or uh, yeah, does deliberate learning involve memorizing and using the dictionary rather than assumption of the meaning out of the context? Uh, you, you're a step ahead of me, but the answer is yes. It, it involves using dictionaries, uh, giving deliberate attention to words and being taught words. I'll move on now then to the third strand. So the third strand is deliberate learning. And this is what teachers and learners think about when they think of language classes. They imagine the teacher standing up in front of the class and teaching them words and teaching them grammar and, and they might imagine themselves doing exercises and course books and so on. In fact, this should make up only about one quarter of the time in a well-balanced course. Deliberate learning of vocabulary is very effective. Um, learning using flashcards with the, word, the English word on one side and its translation on the other side, or using a flashcard program, which involves them looking at a word and then having to recall what the meaning is, are very effective for learning vocabulary. But this deliberate learning should only make up one quarter of the course time. The other three quarters of the course time involve making use of the language through input, output, and fluency development. So I think language courses should include deliberate learning, but unfortunately, most language courses include too much deliberate teaching. And I think one of the ways in which to improve language courses is to cut down on the teaching and start increasing the amount of input and output and fluency development. And there's plenty of research to support this. The fourth strand of a course is the fluency development strand. And in fluency development, learners get really good at using what they already know. In the fluency development strand, there are no, there's no new vocabulary, no new grammar, and largely familiar ideas. But the learners get really good at becoming fluent in listening, becoming fluent in reading, becoming fluent in writing, and becoming fluent in speaking. In reading, for example, there are speed reading courses available. You can find many free ones on my web resources page. They're at the 500 word level, I think. Yes, the, the 1000 level, the 2000, 3000, the academic word list level. There are speed reading courses which help learners get fluent in reading the words they already know. There are also many activities for fluency development. In listening, there's the activity of listening to stories where the teacher chooses a really easy story for the learners to listen to and reads it to them, starting rather slowly, repeating each phrase or sentence. And as the story get, 
continues like a serial, a few minutes each class. The story gets a bit faster and a bit faster. And the learner's knowledge of the story and the knowledge of the topic vocabulary makes it easier for them to understand as the story continues. And the learner, and then the teachers can then increase the speed at which they're um, delivering and reduce the repetitions so that by the time they get about halfway through the book that they're listening to, the teacher is reading at a normal speech level in terms of speed. One of my favorite fluency development activities for speaking is the 432 activity where learners work in pairs and one learner in each pair is a speaker and the other is a listener. And the speaker talks about a very easy topic that they know a lot about in English. And the listener just sits quietly and listens. The listener doesn't interrupt or ask any questions, but just looks interested and listens to the story. And then after four minutes of this, the teacher says stop and the learners change partners and the same speakers tell the same story again to their new partner, but this time they have to fit it into three minutes. And then after three minutes, the teacher says stop and they change. And then for two minutes, the speaker has to tell the same story again to their new partner in their pair but this time has to fit it into two minutes. And so by the end of the activity, the speaker has spoken for four plus three plus two minutes. So a total of nine minutes telling the story or the, the description three times. And each learner has listened to three different stories, one for four minutes, one for three minutes, one for two minutes with a different partner. And so, uh, this is really good for spoken fluency development and also helps the listening fluency development of the learners who are listening. Uh, easy extensive reading is another fluency development activity where learners read graded readers which are way below their present level, which are really easy for them, but they try to read them quickly. Uh, ten minute writing is a very useful activity for improving fluency in writing and that is where learners can write about anything that they want to write about, anything that they know a lot about and they write for ten minutes where the teacher says go and the teacher says stop after the ten minute period and then they count the number of words they've written and put them on a graph and then the next time they write they can continue with the same topic or write about something different, but this time they have to try and write more words than they did before. So a well-balanced language course then provides opportunity for learning and for vocabulary learning through input, through output, through deliberate learning and through fluency development. And the really important thing to remember about these strands is that each strand should get roughly equal time in a course. So if you're a teacher and you want to check whether you're putting the principle of the four strands into practice, you should look back over your teaching over the last two weeks or a month and say, well, what activities did I do in this lesson? What strand would I classify that activity into? And how much time did I spend on it? And you do a little bit of adding up like that to see if you're getting a roughly equal balance of the four strands. I'll pause there for a few questions, if you like. Yeah, so going off of what you just said, we had a few questions regarding, I guess, uh, the prioritization of each of these strands. So we yes. had kind of a question here of in two hours a week of English, uh, which strand should be prioritized and uh, kind of a double headed question. Is it plausible to incorporate these four strands in a single lesson to optimize students lexical gain? Yeah, uh, you don't you don't have to incorporate them in a single lesson. You can if you want to, but there is no special reason to do that. But in terms of prioritization, there is no prioritization. Each strand is important 
And so you should get equal opportunity to learn through each strand. So a quarter of the time on input, a quarter on output, a quarter on deliberate learning, and a quarter on fluency development. So prioritization is not an issue at all here. Each of those four strands needs equal attention. Any other questions? Do one more before we move on. Um, let's see. Uh, Sorry about this. So, do you think academic vocabulary should be taught separately from the rest of vocabulary? Uh, no. Uh, I think we, we're getting beyond children here, but if we look at academic vocabulary, academic vocabulary, um, we divide up the vocabulary of, of English uh, in two major ways. One way is to divide it up according to frequency. And that is to say high frequency words, mid frequency words, low frequency words. And we generally use data counts to, to decide what's the first thousand, the second thousand, third thousand, and so on. If you're interested in these words, if you look at my resources page, you will find that the, we have the head words of the first 10,000 words of English listed there for you to look at and use if you want to use. Another way of dividing up the vocabulary is to look at specialist areas of knowledge and to say, well, is there a vocabulary for academic uh, study? And there is, clearly there is. And is there a vocabulary, a technical vocabulary for each subject? And clearly there is. And so we can focus on academic vocabulary and technical vocabulary as separate kinds of vocabulary. But academic vocabulary and technical vocabulary come from the various frequency levels of the first thousand, second thousand, third thousand, and so on. And the reason for focusing on academic vocabulary is if you have a class of learners who are going on to do academic study in English in secondary schools or in universities, then one way of quickly getting the vocabulary that they need is to focus on this specialized academic vocabulary. So it's a good idea to focus on it if the learners have that purpose for learning English. Good, okay, we'll move on. So we've now looked at the four strains and in the handout which goes with this, there's several teaching activities which are mentioned. If you look at my resources page, you'll also find that there are many free videos, short videos, which demonstrate these teaching activities. And so you can just click on them and watch, for example, learners doing the 432 activity or watch learners doing extensive reading. Our goal is to get about 40 different activities up on the web and free videos so that teachers can see them. Now, We've looked at what vocabulary to learn, and we've looked at the general course design and techniques of the four strands principle of making sure that the learners have a chance to learn through input, output, deliberate learning, and through fluency development. Now let's narrow down and get more particular about vocabulary learning. There are two things that really matter in vocabulary learning repetition and the quality of meetings with words. The more often the learners meet a word, the more likely they are to learn. So that's why repetition is important. Meeting the word again and again and again increases the chances of it being learned. There are various kinds of repetition. I've listed them there in the PowerPoint, which is exact re repetition, where the word occurs exactly in the same form and, and through the same listening, speaking, or reading, writing medium as it occurred before. 
or it can occur in a varied repetition. That is, where either a different form of the word occurs, such as plural instead of singular, or past tense instead of present, or occurs in a context which is different from how it was met before. When you learn words through flashcards or word card learning, you are using exact repetition because you're just looking at the same word form and trying to recall the same first language meaning. When you do extensive reading, you are doing varied repetition because through studying extensive reading texts and other reading texts, we have found that words typically occur in different contexts each time they occur. Some words occur in sometimes in exactly the same sentence as they occurred before, but typically there is some change in the context. And this is good because varied repetition is more effective than exact repetition. Both are useful, but varied is more effective. And when learners do extensive reading and extensive listening, they get many opportunities for varied repetition. Now, two other aspects of repetition, whether it's immediate repetition or spaced repetition, are very important. There's a, the immediate repetition means you meet something and then immediately you look at it again or hear it again and immediately you hear it again. So when you are studying word cards or the teacher's teaching a word, you get immediate repetition. Spaced repetition in, involves meeting the word again, but a few hours later, or a day later, or a few days later. Spaced repetition is much more effective for long-term memory than immediate repetition. This is one of the strongest findings in memory research. If you want to use repetition to help learning, use spaced repetition. That is, give attention to something now, and then give attention to it again in a few hours' time, give it attention to it again a day later, give it attention again a day after that, and so on. It's much more useful to space your repetitions than to do a lot of immediate hard, hard work, if you like, concentrating, doing it over and over again for an hour. Doing it over and over again for an hour, doing exact repetition for an hour, exact immediate repetition is not nearly as effective as spacing the, that repetition using the same amount of time but spacing it across many days or weeks. So repetition is important and in any language course teachers should make sure that the same material is met again at least four or five times in the course. If you're working from a course book, it's really important that you go back to lessons that have been studied previously and quickly do a repetition of the material which was in part of that lesson. If there was a reading text in the lesson, go back to it a week later when you're on another part of the book and have get learners to quickly read what they read before. Or take an exercise from a previous lesson and change it in some small way so that the learners have to do it again. One of the teacher's goals in making sure that learning occurs is to make sure that the same material is met many times in a course. So repetition is really important. It's the basis for vocabulary learning and for most learning. The, the second factor which is really important is the quality of meetings with words. When you meet a word, what do you do with that word at the moment that you meet it? And what I've done in the, in the PowerPoint is to list deepening ways of the quality of meetings with words. Simply noticing a word is the most superficial meeting with a word. It's useful but it's not a very deep way of processing. Looking up a word in the dictionary is noticing. Hearing the teacher explain the meaning of a word is noticing. This helps learning 
and it's a really good first step in learning a word. Guessing a word from context is noticing. Now, if you want to really learn a word, you must then go to deeper levels. And the, the next level is the level of retrieval. And retrieval involves having to recall what you have learnt before. So when you learners do extensive reading, they'll meet a word that they don't know and either guess its meaning, look it up in a dictionary, or ask someone to give the meaning of the word. Then when they meet that word again, they have the opportunity to try and recall the meaning that they met before. This retrieval is really important for learning and it strengthens the connection between the form of the word and the meaning of the word. Now, an even deeper condition than retrieval is varied retrieval. And we looked at that in terms of repetition. And that is meeting the word again in a new context and having to retrieve or recall the meaning that the word had when you met it before. An even deeper condition than retrieval is elaboration. And elaboration involves some kind of analysis or association with the words. So breaking a word into word parts is a kind of elaboration. Uh, seeing a word as a word family with its related members is a form of elaboration of a word. Using a memory trick like the keyword technique is a form of elaboration to help remember a word. And the final um, factor I've got in quality of meetings is deliberate study. Giving deliberate attention to a word by studying it on word cards is a way of adding quality to the meetings with words. So if vocabulary is repeated, and if the meetings with the words each time it is repeated is deep and thoughtful, then vocabulary has a very good chance of being learned. I think we could probably pause there for a few questions. Yep, so going off of that one here, so we have a question here. In terms of spaced repetition, is it effective for remembering low frequency words? It's effective for remembering all words. And, and it's not only effective for vocabulary, it's effective for whatever learning you want to do. Spaced repetition has been researched across a whole range of learning situations. Learning ideas, you know, under, um, learning facts about the world, learning vocabulary, learning people's names, whatever. Spaced repetition is effective for all of those kinds of learning. Do one more here. What might be an optimal number of word re-encounters in order to sustain <laughs> incidental vocabulary learning through listening or reading? For example, some suggest that six to eight times should be enough, while others say 20 times or even more would be required. Yeah, this is what we call the holy grail of vocabulary studies. How many repetitions are needed for learning? There's no easy answer to that. But there is very interesting research about it. The reason there's no easy answer is each word is not of equal difficulty when it comes to learning. Um, it depends on the relationship between your first language and English. If, if you're a Spanish speaker learning English, then a lot of words require very few repetitions indeed because they're almost the same word as in Spanish. Some words... Uh, are very complicated, have very irregular and complicated spellings. So this requires more effort. Some words have concepts which are really quite difficult to understand and you have to really experience the use of that word in, in a lot of different contexts before you come to a real understanding of what that word means. So all words are not equal in difficulty and that's why we don't have a, a fixed number of repetitions. But there's been very interesting research done by Norbert Schmidt and his students using eye tracking. And what they do is 
they get learners to read a text and they use eye tracking software to see how long they focus on each word that they that they are reading and they can measure what fraction of a second or how many seconds are focusing on each word they find that with about around about somewhere between five and seven repetitions a word which is unfamiliar to the learners once it's met around about five or six or seven times they the the amount of time spent focusing on the word is the same as the time spent focusing on already known words so th th this is quite clever research because it's getting sort of saying well if the learners meet a new word and then they meet it several times how long before it's treated as if it's a known word and it seems to be somewhere around about five to seven repetitions I think, however, that if you also back that up with a test, you would find that their knowledge of the word is still a little insecure and that more repetitions would be much more, much would be very useful in strengthening knowledge of that word. So we're looking at a, a, a very minimum of, of, say, five or seven repetitions. But I think we really need to be looking at something like 15 or 20 repetitions. Rob Waring, uh, Waring and Takaki's study of, of vocab learning from reading a graded reader found that after 15 or 20 repetitions, some words were still not learned. Other words were learned, but some words were not. So you really have to have quite a lot of repetitions. Any other questions? Yeah, we're running down about 15 minutes. Is that going to be enough time for you? Uh, just checking there. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. I'm going to get to the end. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we'll do pull one question here from the chat. Last one. Does repetition vary according to the age and how intense it should be for little kids? Oh. That's an interesting question. I don't know if if there is a difference in repetition between learners of different ages. It would, it, it's an interesting research question. Uh, if you're thinking of doing a PhD, that would be a really interesting question to investigate. There'd be lots of difficult variables to control, but I, I just don't know the answer to that. Um, my guess is that there would not be a difference between children and young adults and even uh, the, the relationship between age and learning is a difficult one but I, I would think that there shouldn't really be a difference but maybe there is uh, what was the second part of that question is how, how intense should it be for little kids how intense yeah well it should be spaced and so Re re repetition, so spaced repetition, by intense, I'm, I'm sort of understanding that you're looking at immediately going into the word again and again and again. That's not a good way of learning. A good way is to do something with the word, meet it in the piece of reading, look up its meaning in the dictionary, or talk about it a little bit with someone, and then come back to it the next day. So in that way, it shouldn't be intense. If intense has the meaning of, should the learners be reading lots of material and listening to lots of material, then yes, very much so. The more input there is, the greater the amount of learning will be. Okay, let's move on then to the final section. How can parent, teachers and parents support vocabulary learning? Number one, make sure the learners are focusing on useful vocabulary. I talked about this uh, earlier on. Uh, it's useful to know how many words your learners know. Teachers tend to underestimate how many words their learners know. This occurs with both native speakers and non-native speakers. And it's useful then to, to actually get some of your learners to sit a test to see how many words they know. Um, 
It depends on your attitude of the learners to test. But when we test native speakers in New Zealand secondary schools and primary schools, we test them individually, one by one. And this takes a lot of time. But one thing that we are sure of is that if we test them individually, they are doing the best that they can do on that test. When we compared testing learners in groups with testing learners individually, we found that for about a quarter to a third of the learners, their score in a group situation where they're all sitting, you know, answering a test without anybody sitting next to them, they didn't do nearly as well as people of the same level did when they were had someone sitting next to them, keeping them on task and doing the test. So initially, at least, I would be testing learners individually with the teacher sitting next to them and making sure that they're giving it their best shot and using the best test-taking strategies. So that's the first thing then. Find out how many words your learners know and make sure that they are focusing on the vocabulary that they, that they need at that level of knowledge. Is it the, the high frequency words? If it's the high frequency words they need to know, is it the first thousand, the second thousand, or the third thousand? If they already know the first 3,000 words, do they need academic vocabulary? Or do they just need to go on to the mid frequency words of the fourth, the fifth, and so on? If they're doing study, they may need to be focusing on technical vocabulary. Second guideline. Encourage learners to do lots of listening and reading at the right level. Um, this is very, very important. One of the people who has done the most to encourage the, uh, the idea of the importance of quantity of input is Stephen Krashen. And over the years, Steve Krashen has really pushed the idea of the importance of extensive reading for vocabulary learning. I think he's right about that. Uh, I disagree with him that this should be the major kind of learning and, in fact, the only kind of learning that learners do. But I think it's a really important part of the course. Recently, Rob Waring and I did uh, published a book on learning from extensive reading. And we reviewed all of the research that was available to us and, and sorted out what we thought were the best pieces of research and, and reviewed them very thoroughly. And th there's no doubt that getting lots of reading input and listening input is a very good way of increasing vocabulary knowledge. There's a few little techniques and strategies which can go with this. Listening to stories is a listening activity, one of my favorite ones, actually. And I think, I'm not quite sure, but I think there's a video about that. The pause prompt praise procedure is quite useful. And that is, if you are working with a learner individually, if you're a parent helping your children, your child learn to read, then you shouldn't rush in with answers when they struggle with words in their reading. You should pause. And then you give the prompt means give them a clue. You know, the first letter is P or something like this. And then when they get it right, praise them. So really what pause, prompt, praise does, that little procedure, is to make sure that learners have a chance to do retrieval. And you might remember that retrieval is a really important quality condition for vocabulary learning. The shared book activity, where the learner, where the teacher reads a book aloud to the learners and they, they interact between teacher and learners about the book, a reading of a graded reader, is a really good activity for um, uh, listening and reading input. Getting learners to do independent reading of graded readers. If your learners are not reading graded readers, and they know, sorry, if your learners know less than three or 4,000 words and they are not doing lots of reading of graded readers, then they're missing out on what could be one of the major sources of vocabulary knowledge for them. If you want to make a single, the single most important improvement you can make to a language course, add an extensive reading program. 
that extensive reading program doesn't have to be in addition to class time. If you want to do it within class time, you can. That's great. But there's tons of research showing that if you provide opportunities for an extensive reading course, you will get lots and lots of language learning benefits from this. The research is very clear about that. The third guideline, get learners to talk and write about what they have read or listened to. Get them to do retrieval. So that when they talk and write about what they've read and listened to, they're, they're getting repetitions of what they've met before and they're having to recall their knowledge, recall the words, recall the meanings that they met before. This is retrieval. Come back to the same part of the lesson several times, sometimes doing exact repetition and sometimes doing varied repetition. Uh, about a third of the time in a language course should be, at least, should be spent dealing with material which has already been dealt with before, but dealing with it in a faster way or in a somewhat different way from how it's been met before. Quickly give the meanings of words when they are needed. Using the first language is good for doing this, but keep most of the lesson in English. There's, there's, teachers have generally been told that it's not good to use the first language in the classroom. I can see the reason for giving that advice, and that is the learner should get as much input in English in an English lesson as possible. But giving the meanings of words through using a first language equivalent is a very effective way of teaching vocabulary. And the research shows that this, in fact, compared with pictures and dictionary definitions and second language definitions and so on, using the first language is by far the most effective way of communicating the meaning of a word. Develop fluency by working with known material with some pressure to go fast. Learners need to learn quite a lot of words, a lot of vocabulary, but you not only need to learn new things, you need to learn them to a level in which they can be used fluently. So fluency development makes up, should make up one quarter of the course time, dealing with familiar known material across the four skills of listening, speaking, reading and writing and pushing to go a little bit faster than, would, than the learners would normally be able to deal with. This doesn't mean going faster than native speakers. It simply means going faster than, so that you start to get to the speed at which a native speaker would be able to speak, listen, read, write. Teach learners how to learn. Even very young learners should know the importance of repetition. They should know the importance of spaced retrieval. They should know the importance of varied retrieval. They should know the importance of getting quantity of input and output. They should know about the four strings. They should know the value in analyzing words into word parts and making meaningful connections between form and meaning. And they should also know about the importance of learning high-frequency words between low-frequency words. This is what I mean by cost-benefit. At any stage of a language course, the learner should be getting the greatest benefit they can from the cost of the effort that they put into that learning. And this happens by learning words roughly in order of frequency levels. I think teaching learners how to learn is very important because when learners can take control of their own learning, then they can really learn without the need for a teacher being there and they can learn um, <coughs> outside of the classroom. The final thing is teach learners about vocabulary word consciousness. I haven't talked about this, but there's lots of ideas about vocabulary that learners should really start to deal with. And these are ideas, for example, that words occur in word families. 
so that there are families of words which share the same stem but they have different prefixes. They should learn um, about the frequency levels of words and all of this sort of stuff. I've written about this in another book, uh, which I'll show you in the further reading, about what every primary school teacher should know about vocabulary. There's a whole chapter on word consciousness in that. So I think what I've given here is eight guidelines for you to follow regarding the learning of vocabulary. You can apply these guidelines whether you teach from a course book or you use your own material, whatever, it doesn't matter. But it's really important that you follow principles like that so that learners get the opportunity to learn across the four strands. Okay, I'm happy now to answer or try to answer any questions you want to ask. So we have about a minute or so here. So we can pick about one question. Um, let's see. We have just saw a question a second ago. Uh, I think it was in the Q and A. Yeah, so this one was a bit of a long one. So when we have students retell what they have, what they have read or listened to, we expect that they would use newly acquired words from the given input in their talk. However, this is not always the case as students often avoid using the words that they have not fully mastered yet. Should we still push them to use these newly learned words in their retelling, even though this does not appear to be an authentic task? I, my feeling would be that you probably should not push them. Um, one of my PhD students did some research on this with the idea of using words learned from reading in their writing. And they found that, as you said, that learners were reluctant to use words that they didn't feel they knew well enough. I think it's okay for learners to be brave enough to take risks. But I also feel that uh, if they feel uncertain about that, I think it just adds stress by pushing them to use it. I, my guess is then that the activity that you're doing should really be based on material which is a bit easier. Okay. And then do one last one here. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your thoughts on visual scaffolding for vocabulary? How much does it matter to have images connected to input? Well, I think images connected to input can be a form of elaboration. So I, I think it can have a very positive effect on learning. Um, the only trouble is that you've got to really make a good connection between the visual input and the vocabulary. Um, for example, having pictures in reading books uh, has mixed effects. Sometimes it doesn't help reading and the learning of vocabulary because the learners are getting the meaning through the pictures rather than through the text. And so there's some research which shows that, in fact, pictures don't make uh, reading books better at teaching reading comprehension. But I also think that having striking visual images where learners associate words can be a form of elaboration which makes words stick in memory. So I think the effects are, are mixed. Um, and I think that it should be something that you use rather carefully. So we'll go ahead and end it there. If you guys have any other questions uh, for Paul, uh, you can feel free to email us at uh, eFuture and we can uh, relay some of these questions to you, Paul, if that is okay. Um, then you can possibly answer for them um, at a later time. Um, getting close to the end here. So just want to give these final information for all of our attendees here. So thank you so much uh, for joining with us. Um, so just to give a big thanks again to Paul Nation for taking his time out for you know, a lot of useful information for, for all of you teachers out there. Hopefully you guys learned a lot. I know I did. It's great to have all these great questions and have them answered. 
Um, so please feel free to send some questions our way as well. Um, here is our webinar schedule again for the rest of the month. We have two more uh, webinars uh, coming up uh, the last two weeks of the, the month, of mostly circled around uh, digital tools and uh, doing things uh, for online classes and digital resources. So feel, uh, be sure to register for those. Uh, regarding the certificates and, um, and getting the slides, uh, this, these are our partners that you should contact for certificates and for uh, if you need or want uh, Paul Nation's uh, PowerPoint. So feel free to contact these uh, wonderful people here. Um, so these are our partners. And for those that aren't in the countries listed here on the very bottom, just contact us directly for all of these. And again, follow us on our, all of our social media. And all, we have Facebook and we have YouTube. The webinar will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. So for those that want to review all the things that were covered today, uh, we will be posting the webinar on our YouTube channel. So don't be, don't be too worried that this is a one and done deal. We do have it uh, on our YouTube channel very soon. And for all of the updates and everything, please follow us on Facebook. Our Facebook information is here. I'll be sure to update all of our uh, webinar postings. So when the video is uploaded on YouTube, we will be posting the link on the uh, September schedule and updating it that way as well. So be sure to look out for that. And I believe uh, one of my colleagues did post the survey feedback form in the chat. So please feel free to fill that out. If you have questions for Paul or for our future uh, webinar uh, hosts in the future, you can put all the questions in there and send it uh, to us, as well as uh, suggest any webinar topics that you would like to be covered uh, in the future. So please fill that out for us, let us know what you think and what you would like from us going forward. And so once again, I would like to thank Paul Nation again for taking your time out today. You know, you know, it's been a kind of crazy, crazy 2020 year, but thank you for taking uh, some time out to help the teachers around the world <laughs> uh, with regards to teaching vocabulary and what they can do for their students. Okay. So thank you all for, for joining and we'll see you guys soon. So take care. And I'll put up the contact information one more time. So if you need to take a picture of it or see it here, we'll be signing off here. So thank you again and stay safe, everyone.